Hello and welcome to this lecture on the major minerals. In this lecture, we're going to cover the major minerals with the exception of calcium and sodium, which we'll do in their own separate individual lectures. The first major mineral that we'll look at is potassium. Potassium is important because its primary functions include things such as maintaining your fluid balance, assisting with nerve impulse transmission, and helping to lower your blood pressure. Now that's an important component because recent data has indicated that while it's certainly important to reduce the amount of sodium in your diet to bring down high blood pressure, increasing the amount of potassium in your diet may be just as an effective way of bringing down high blood pressure. And where do we find potassium? Well, the primary sources of potassium include fruits and vegetables. And luckily, fruits and vegetables are naturally low in sodium. So the notion goes that the more fruits and vegetables you eat, because they're high in potassium and low in sodium, will help bring down your blood pressure. Um, another note about potassium is that potassium is the primary positively charged intracellular ion. So it's one of the elements that exists within the cells. Potassium deficiency is rare, but it could be caused by people who are losing excessive amounts of fluid. So for example, if you have chronic diarrhea, vomiting, for people who abuse laxatives, excuse me, people who abuse alcohol, individuals with eating disorders or very low calorie diets could be at risk for developing potassium deficiency. Although note again that it's quite rare. Symptoms of potassium deficiency include things like loss of appetite, muscle cramps, confusion, constipation, and most importantly, irregular heartbeat. Because another function of potassium is that it helps keep your heart beating in a healthy manner. In excess, there's no UL listed for potassium, so there's no upper limit if you were to look on the DRI tables. And to be honest, typical food intakes and normal food patterns would not lead you to develop a potassium toxicity, provided that you have healthy kidneys. Now, the situation changes if you have poor kidney function or kidney disease. In that case, potassium can build up in the blood and inhibit the heart from functioning, actually lower heartbeat. Where do we find potassium? As I mentioned, fruits and vegetables are great sources. If you had to pick probably the three fruits and vegetables that have the highest potassium content, it would be potatoes, tomatoes, and bananas. Now, for most people that are trying to eat more potassium and help bring their blood pressure down, those are good sources of potassium. But for people that have kidney disease, they need to limit the amount of potatoes, tomatoes, and bananas in their diet, as well as other high potassium foods. Milk, whole grains, dried beans, and meat also contain potassium. And note how most of those foods are unprocessed foods. The more processed the food is, the lower the potassium content will be. The next major mineral is chloride. Chloride is located in between cells, in the extracellular space, and it has a negative charge. One of the most let's say, notable functions of chloride is that it is a component of your stomach acid, hydrochloric acid. So that Cl in HCl is the chloride in hydrochloric acid. Chloride plays a role in nerve function, because it is an electrolyte, and also in your immune response. Chlorified deficiency, chloride deficiency rather, is unlikely in the typical American diet because the primary dietary source of chloride is table salt. Table salt is sodium chloride. So about half of that molecule is chloride. And since most Americans eat plenty of sodium chloride or plenty of table salt, it's not likely that they would become deficient in chloride. Now, if you were, however, to vomit for prolonged periods of time due to illness, or if something else caused you to lose a large amount of stomach acid, which also provides your body with chloride, then, for, then there would be an instance when perhaps you'd be deficient in chloride. In excess, chloride works along with salt or sodium in raising your blood pressure. So there is an upper limit of 3,600 milligrams per day. Chloride intake in the United States tends to be high because, of course, of that high sodium chloride or table salt intake that most of us experience. Dietary sources of chloride mentioned table salt, sodium chloride. Uh, fruits and vegetables contain a little bit of chloride, but chlorinated water may also in certain areas represent a good amount of chloride in your diet depending upon 
you know, what your situation is. If you're drinking a lot of, so you hike a lot and you chlorinate your water to clean it, then maybe that would be a source of chloride. The next major mineral we'll look at is phosphorus. Phosphorus comprises just about 1% of your adult body weight. And 85% of that mineral is going to be located in your bones and your teeth. Phosphorus is actually more readily absorbable than calcium, and it plays an important role in your bone health. Phosphorus is also a primary component of ATP, so that good cellular enzyme, and it allows enzymes and B vitamins to do their job. In every cell, phosphorus plays a role in the sense that uh, phosphorus is part of the phospholipid membrane. It helps maintain your blood pH and fluid balance. Again, it's part of the DNA and RNA, so part of your genetic material. Here's a slide that shows you the relationship between phosphorus and energy metabolism. Phosphorus is important in energy metabolism because you have high energy bonds of ATP that are formed between phosphate groups within the cell. Phosphorus is a compound or component of phospholipids, which form the structure of all of your cell membranes. Phosphorus is involved in regulating enzyme activity. The addition of a phosphorus-containing group to certain enzymes can activate or deactivate them. Phosphorus is also a major part of DNA and RNA, which facilitate the synthesis of different proteins. Phosphorus is part of the compound that can prevent changes in acidity so that chemical reactions inside the cell can proceed normally. You can see that even at the cellular level, phosphorus, which you require in very small amounts in your body, is actually a very important major mineral. Phosphorus deficiency may be seen in preterm infants, in vegans, in people who are alcoholics, who have nutrient poor diets, or who have persistent diarrhea. As far as excess goes, there is an upper limit set dependent upon age and gender group, somewhere between three to four grams, so that's 3,000 to 4,000 milligrams a day. High intake of phosphorus, because it's a mineral, it can crystallize and possibly cause tissue calcification and stone formation. Chronic imbalance of your phosphorus and your calcium levels can increase your risk of low bone mineral density. And low bone mineral density, as you'll learn, is associated with poor bone health. Dietary sources of phosphorus. Now, phosphorus is naturally abundant in many types of foods. You find it in foods like milk and cheese, meat and bread, as well as nuts, fish, breakfast cereal, bran, and eggs. And it's also added as part of food additives. The next major mineral is magnesium. Magnesium plays a role in your nerve and your heart function. It's a cofactor for over 300 different enzymatic reactions. Your body needs magnesium in order to generate the energy, so to derive the cellular fuel from the carbs, fats, and proteins that we eat. It also does play a structural role in the sense that magnesium provides some rigidity for bones. Magnesium deficiency can result in poor bone health, including poor bone development, formation, and bone resorption. Symptoms of magnesium deficiency include irregular heartbeat, weakness, muscle pain, disorientation, and seizures. There is an upper limit for magnesium and that's set at 350 milligrams per day. Too much magnesium can cause diarrhea and there's actually uh, medications and supplements that people sometimes take when they're constipated that contain magnesium or magnesium salts in order to promote motility or the movement through the gut and bowel movements. It's unlikely that you would reach toxic levels of magnesium from food. As with almost all of the micronutrients, with the exception of sodium, most people only exceed the UL from supplements. Toxicity with magnesium, however, can occur with people who have kidney failure or those who abuse over-the-counter laxatives and antacids that have magnesium. For example, milk of magnesia. Dietary sources of magnesium. Magnesium is found in chlorophyll and comes from plant sources. Also squash, whole grains, bran, beans, Nuts, seeds, and broccoli all contain magnesium. Magnesium is in animal products like milk and meats. And there's actually a little bit of in chocolate as well. Depending upon what the municipal water supply is like where you live, if you have hard tap water, that can contain magnesium. And magnesium is also found in coffee, uh, more so in espresso as opposed to brewed coffee. The last slide here is looking at sulfur. 
Although sulfur is a major mineral, we don't learn a ton about it. Uh, sulfur is found in protein foods and also in sulfur-containing amino acids. Sulfur-containing amino acids like methionine and cysteine are important for protein synthesis. As far as sources go, the vitamins thiamine and biotin also contain sulfur. There's no RDA or DRI for sulfur, so there's no UL, and little is known about what happens if we consume too little or too much sulfur.